Good evening. Welcome to the talk show at the 92nd Street Y. Um, are you chocolate or peanut butter? I'm the peanut butter. <laughs> Welcome. Um, we're here with uh, my good friend Brett Stevens. This is not the first time we've done this. It's not the first time we've done this here at the 92nd Street Y. This might be for some of you, you've seen us here before. I like to think he almost grew up on this stage. Um, the first time he was here, I actually called him a wunderkind. And the reason for that was he was, uh, I don't know how old you were, but when you were in Jerusalem, which is shortly after the beginning of the Second Intifada, as the editor-in-chief of the yeah. Jerusalem Post, you were a very young person. Yeah, it was several years before my bar mitzvah. Right, and, <laughs> and I joked that night that it was just around the time of his bar mitzvah. And then I think that was that night, and maybe tonight you can recall that experience of what it was like you were recently married and you were in Jerusalem and there was a bus bombing, and you had grown up, you know, in New York and in Mexico City, and, you know, obviously bus bombings is not something you'd ever seen before, and you, here you were, the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, and for God's sakes, you need to go see it. Uh, well, it's a, it's a gruesome way to introduce the conversation. Um, so, first of all, thank you for, for coming out tonight, and nice to see you, Thane. Um, it wasn't really my first question. I was just reminded of th that he, t and some of you may have heard this answer before. Well, look, uh, you know, when you, when you speak about suicide bombings, um, you ask how many people were killed, uh, where did it happen, you're curious about uh, the bomber, you wonder about his motives, usually his, sometimes hers. Uh, Th there is a, there's a great difference when you actually see what a uh, bombing uh, looks like, which is to say that um, the purpose of suicide bombing is to turn, how shall I put this, uh, ordinary life into an abattoir. It's to turn human life into uh, flesh, uh, dead flesh. And um, uh, so, uh, in this case, it was uh, January of 2004. It was the bus bombing on Aza Street. Uh, my wife and I were tending to our then month old baby uh, when we heard a loud boom. I turned around, there was a plume of smoke. We lived a block from Aza Street. I went downstairs, and I was, I think, the first uh, person uh, on the scene. In Israel, when bus bombings or bombings occur, the emergency medical services come very quickly, obviously, to tend to the wounded, to, to count the dead. Uh, the Zaka people start collecting uh, body, uh, 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 body parts. But by the time, by the 20 minute mark or 25 minute mark, uh, the police have cordoned the area so that you're, what you see is, is at a considerable distance. I saw it five feet away. And it gives you a very different perception um, of terrorism, uh, uh, less of a, uh, terrorism ceases to be a kind of an intellectual abstraction or kind of a, a scary idea and becomes the, the reality of, of mass murder. And, and once you've seen it, you think about these sorts of issues in a fundamentally different way. And clearly you had never been prepared to see anything like that. You, um, you came back to the United States to the Wall Street Journal Shortly after that, you were received the, uh, your, the, your, your column, your weekly column, which is the Global View column. Uh, and uh, you had that for about 10 years, I guess, or longer. 11 years. 11 yeah. years. Uh, it, during that time, you won a, a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, you are now a, a, a weekly columnist uh, at the New York Times. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, and you're also a, 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 a senior political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC, which I'm sure many of you have seen Brett in that capacity. Now, if you had told me 18 months ago that I would be a columnist for the New York Times and an MSNBC News analysis. Yeah. He also writes I, for The Nation. I would ask you what exactly who your drug dealer yeah, is. Right. Well, the one thing that's true that the, w w the New York Times, and if you d haven't been reading Brett, I'm sure everyone here has. You read them on Friday mornings uh, at the Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings. It's the Friday. It's it's a it's a Shabbat uh, read, yeah. uh, and it was I think a gesture of the New York Times for incredibly creepy coverage of Israel. This is what they gave back for the Jews that you have Shabbat reading, Brett Stevens. 
Well, let's let's talk about this. Before we get to that, I, I wanted to. I have my, this was really my first question, but we jumped into the bus bombing, which was, <clears throat> you know, you might have won a Pulitzer Prize because of Barack Obama's foreign policy, uh, to some extent. Uh, and I wonder now, given the last. 18 months, and the fact that you're now at the New York Times, my first question really is, do you miss Barack Obama? Uh, you were merciless with the man yeah. for eight years, uh, but now that we know how you feel about President Trump, I think- Maybe I, look, I just don't like President. Yeah. <laughs> but I look back and I think, President Obama, here's a guy with moral discipline, uh, never once tweeted, uh, wasn't eating hamburgers, cheeseburgers in bed. Well, that we know of. That we know of. Uh, in Kenya, I'm sure he ate the cheeseburgers. <laughs> carried himself with great dignity. Uh, uh, you know, given what you've been saying about President Trump, uh, is there something about the moral character of this man that you actually regret that we don't have in the White now House? Look, please don't mistake me. Um, I was never anything but proud that Barack Obama, the man, was president of the United States. And, you know, in the United States, unlike in, say, Great Britain, the president occupies two inherent functions. He's both head of government as well as head of state. I mean, to give you the contrast, in Great Britain, the head of state is, is the queen, right. and she represents the kind of the dignity of the country. And then the head of government is uh, Mrs. May or Mr. Cameron or, or whoever it happens uh, uh, to be. So in the president, th this, this function is merged. And what you want is a president who, when he occupies the head of state role, is someone you can always feel uh, good about. So for instance, I, I, I used to watch just uh, for whatever reasons, I would always try to watch Medal of Honor ceremonies. And when President Obama was bestowing a Medal of Honor on uh, whatever soldier uh, had, had won it, at that moment he was 100% my president. I felt nothing except that here was the man who in the most dignified possible way represented the dignity of, of the office. And, and there was a direct line connecting him to, to the first document, to George Washington. It was on policy that I had all kinds of differences with Barack Obama and I think he did a terrible job on Syria and I think the Iran deal is a big mistake and you know that's an argument to be had another way. One of my objections to Trump was that I couldn't see him as a credible head of state. And I think that he is materially damaging the office of the presidency because it will be difficult to see the president as any kind of moral authority figure um, after, uh, after him. And you think that matters? Well, I think it matters a great deal, and it matters especially if you're a conservative. You see, I can understand if you're, if you're politically, say, radical, or even if you're on the left, when, when Clinton was president and having scandals of his own, one line that I often heard from Democratic friends was, moral character doesn't matter, what matters is competence, right? And with the, a Clinton presidency, a booming stock market, America at peace, at home in the world, there was a great argument that Clinton was a competent middle of the road manager who just happened to have an you know, errant genitalia or whatever. Um, uh, uh, and, and that was, you know, that was the argument you heard sort of f from the left. That we don't ask for moral leadership. Right, that we don't ask that that's not the role of the presidency, that the role of the president is just to be an effective CEO. Of course, anyone here who's in business knows that if a CEO behaved as Clinton had, much less as Trump uh, does, they'd be out on their, uh, they'd be out on their, uh, uh, their ear. Um, so, yeah, well, uh, this is. Well, he, <laughs> the, the, you, moral character matters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll save the dirty jokes yeah. for later. Uh, uh, so it was conservatives at the time. I remember William Bennett, who had been Secretary of Education, talking about the death of outrage. Right. I remember uh, when I was sort of coming of age as a conservative, reading Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind, and his, his outrage that truth had become a kind of relative concept in the liberal academic establishment on, on, on college campuses. And the conservatives of my generation, the older ones, the you know, people I, I sort of grew up with, this is what they were f busy talking about. Like this is character matters, right? Uh, culture matters. The culture that a president sets matters. And what's so shocking to me 
is I still think that, but so many of my cohorts in, or f former uh, fellow travelers in, in the conservative world have suddenly discovered complete comfort with the idea that character doesn't matter, right? That truth is kind of in the eye of the beholder, that facts are either facts or they're alternative facts or they're whatever is convenient for the purposes of and the conservative moment. Conservative virtues and values are not relevant to leadership. Right, and that there isn't also an educational function to the presidency. I mean, am I as a parent really required to explain to my children the uh, job description of someone named Stormy Daniels? You do now. Well, this is the thing, right? Right, right. and that, would, that didn't come up even in the Clinton administration. Well, of course, in the Clinton, and, and by the way, here's another point I'd like to make to um, some of the conservative people in the audience. If Hillary Clinton were president, Okay, and her first national security advisor had already pled guilty to lying to the FBI. Okay, and if her daughter's husband, uh, Mark uh, Mavinsky or Mavinsky, yeah. was now running uh, our Middle Eastern foreign policy, right? And if she were busy tweeting that uh, the FBI and the CIA are corrupt Gestapo-like uh, organizations. And the CNN and if, should be killed. And if, and if, if uh, reports coming out from majority uh, Democratic uh, um, uh, uh, caucuses uh, were being uh, released despite the warnings of national security officials that they damaged national security, uh, the, the national security would, um, the organs of American conservative opinion be, you know, Mrs. Clinton, you're right, you're right, you're so right, this is such a nothing burger. There's no, this Russia thing, come on, Mrs. Clinton, okay, so she wanted the reset way back when, but we're so past that. The Republican Party and the conservative establishment would be up in arms demanding impeachment even more loudly than some of my colleagues at the Times do today in the face of Trump doing exactly the same thing. And they've thing. capitulated to this whole new environment. Well, that raises this question about the move from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times. Um, you are, um, in many ways, one of the intellectual leaders of the Never Trump movement, and during the Trump candidacy, you were very critical. And there are some people who wondered whether, in the aftermath of this election, where President Trump is now the standard bearer Republican in the White House, and the Wall Street Journal always saw itself as supporting the loyal supporter of the Republican Party, that the Wall Street Journal maybe wasn't the right home for you well, anymore. Let me, let me stop you for one second. One of the things I always loved about the Wall Street Journal's editorial page is I don't think it thought of itself as the Republican editorial page. I think people like Robert Bartley, the late editor, um, thought of it as a principled voice for a kind of um, uh, liberal conservatism that believed in the power of trade, of markets, of immigration, and of human potential to solve all kinds of problems. So that on one issue after another, like immigration, like trade, the editorial page stood um, aside and, if you will, athwart so much of the conservative, so many, so many kind of old school nativist conservative impulses uh, to uh, favor isolationism, to favor a policy of, of America first. And that was a wonderful institution to be um, uh, a part of. Uh, I, I subscribe to all of those things. My, my views uh, on those fundamental issues haven't changed uh, at all. Uh, so was, so th it wasn't as if the home where really you, you came of age in the Wall Street Journal it's not like you didn't feel home there anymore. I mean, what, what was it? Again, people speculate. They say, you know, maybe he just decided that with Trump now in the White House, in fact, the loyal opposition is the place for Brett Stevens to be. I was, you know, my standard joke about why I moved um, <clears throat> is I was so sick of being hated for my never Trump views at the journal that I decided to go to the Times to be hated for all of my other views. <laughs> um, and there's some, uh, there's some truth to that. Um, I, 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 without, for, for reasons that uh, you, you'll understand, um, 
I had a wonderful time at the Journal and a wonderful career there, and it's a great institution and a, 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 great, a great paper. Um, I felt I was no longer a real fit there because so many readers took such uh, aggressive offense at my belief that Donald Trump is, was and is utterly unfit to hold the office and that he was a danger not just to the country, but actually a danger to the Republican Party, which is to say that the Republican Party is never going to be the party of Ronald Reagan. Or Lincoln. Uh, or much less Lincoln anymore. And it's important that, look, wherever you are politically, um, liberal or, 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 or conservative, you probably would agree with my contention that this country needs a responsible, serious, and decent conservative party, right? Um, so, you know, you might be a wild liberal, and God bless you, uh, but you, you know that at some point the other guys come into office, and you want to be able to say, okay, I don't like them, I'm going to disagree about taxes, the environment, regulation, but the republic will probably survive, and I know that whoever's in charge is not, um, is not morally and mentally unfit. Um, we don't have that anymore. And, and that, that worries me because the Trump party, which is uh, in, at least so far rhetorically and probably eventually legislatively anti-immigrant, anti-trade, um, views foreign policy as a kind of zero-sum game where the question is always what's in it for us and what's in it for us now, which is not inclusive when it comes to uh, minorities, uh, women, um, and which has as, a, um, as its leader a man who is just as intellectually incurious and ignorant and buffoonish and aggressive and nasty as this guy is, gonna, is going to lead the Republican Party in a bad direction. And by the way, what will it do, and I'll say this to the conservatives in this audience, what happens when you get Democratic Trump? What happens when having so debased the office and so having so trashed the uh, ethics and conventions that went with the office of the presidency, you get the same kind of person but with a different set of policy prescriptions? At that point, those conservatives aren't going to have a leg to stand on and say, well, you know, this guy has no morals or this woman is crazy, right? Because you just endorsed that last person uh, when, when he was on your side. So you, you make the move from the Mets to the Yankees, or the Yankees to the Mets. No, uh, no, 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 no. I'm not sure how this move gets. It's from the Mets. It's the Mets to the Yankees, all right. And I'll tell you why. Okay? I'll tell you. No, I, no, I, can I, I just tell you why? Can I tell you something? Yeah. I received a lot of email from people yeah. asking me questions to ask you, yeah. requesting, some of which you can imagine what they are, and I'll get to those. When did I become such a jerk? No. What the, but one is, some of them actually, one woman in particular said, does he know he took a step down? Yeah. And I found that curious. I found that sort of... That, maybe that's her. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I thought that was sort of an interesting... Uh, who would say that? Did someone say this is actually a step down? And, and I, and I, and I want to get to this point because I think you, you, you sort of landed with a splash. <laughs> a splash? Maybe a belly flop would be a way of, of putting it. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about this, this landing. But let me answer that. Do you want to talk that. about the Yankees versus the Mets? You know, when I was at the Journal, I always thought that the Journal and the Times were essentially equivalent in terms of their national influence. Both had roughly the same number of subscribers and, um, you know, big papers that you could find from sort of Nome to Orlando or whatever. Um, that's not true. Uh, the, the difference between the Journal and the Times is the difference between the Grateful Dead and the Beatles. And I'll, let me explain that. Um, Someone's going to be offended here no matter what. I'm just, no, look, the great, I can see the tie-dye from okay. here. The Grateful Dead is a cult band, which means that if you're into the dead, you are really into them. And like Jerry Garcia occupies, is on your mantle and, and whatever, you know, it, you, you inhabit the world of the dead and it's a significant aspect of your life. But if you're not into the dead, then the Grateful Dead is just some band that you realize is, is big for other people, but you don't really know any of the songs. You, you 
would be strained to know the answer, like who's the drummer and so on. The Wall Street Journal is the dead. And the Wall Street Journal is the dead, which is to say that people, most, most people are aware that it exists, but those who don't subscribe to it know very little about it. So what I would find is if I went and gave a talk in, I don't know, San Diego or something, the people who are journal readers would show up and they'd all sort of know all about me and you were kind of a celebrity to this handful of, of usually rich people. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's fine, they're lovely people. Um, uh, but outside of that, people would, would have no idea who you are. Now, when you're at the, at the New York Times, it's the Beatles. Everyone is kind of aware of it and people read it. I mean, it, you don't need to read every Maureen Dowd column to know who Maureen Dowd is, like an important sort of personage in American letters. Uh, um, and so it just has a reach that is, is extraordinary next to, to, the, to the journal. I'll just make one point about the Mets, and I don't want to compare the journal to the Mets because the Mets suck. Um, uh, you know, let me just say something that you don't know about Steve. He doesn't even read the sports page. I don't think he knows the Mets suck. Okay. So, uh, but one thing about the, uh, I, I really felt, someone asked me, so what's the Times like? And, and I was thinking about it. It's like, they are like the Yankees, because on the one hand, they're the greatest team ever. On the other hand, some of the fans can be the biggest jerks on the planet. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some of these Yankee slash New York yeah, Yankee fans, uh, New York Times fans. So on your first day of school in this new school, the New York Times, you probably got nervous about your first day, so my first column, your first Shabbat, and you sort of decide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write about climate change. Yeah. And not only am I going to write about climate, I'm going to tell the world, who don't, who don't already know, because they're not my friends, that I'm a skeptic. I mean, yes, of course I believe in global warming and I believe in climate change, but I kind of think that the science is way out, or rather the, the, the advocacy of the issue is way beyond the science. And that the, the advocates are more extreme. They're too data reliant. And that I want to set this tone, especially in the aftermath of the uh, Democratic elect, uh, presidential election, that the same mistake that pre Hillary Clinton made is I relied on data and the data was wrong, that I'm going to set the same analogy, that people perhaps could be a little more skeptical that the data may be wrong on climate change. Now, that argument, which we can revisit here today, was explosive. 40,000 people signed a petition to have you fired <laughs> on your first day at school. Yes. You could have, you could have, on a baseball analogy, you could have bunted a single. Yeah. You could have just tried to make contact. You decided instead to say, ah, climate change, not for me. So there's a great story. There's um, uh, a minister, a priest, and a rabbi uh, at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks decide to have a competition to see who can, um, who can uh, convert a bear. So um, the priest uh, goes out into the woods, uh, comes, out, comes back an hour or so later, as happy as anything. Says, well, you know, I, I went down the path, huge grizzly gets in my way, sprinkled some holy water on him, and we spent the rest of the day talking about the Lord. The minister says, well, that sounds pretty good. So he goes in, and um, he comes back a little worse for wear, scratched, bruised, but basically OK. Um, and he says, well, I went into the, I went into the woods. Uh, I encountered the bear. I wrestled him into the lake. I dunked him into the lake, baptized him right there, and we spent the rest of the time talking about Jesus. Rabbi then goes, and uh, they, he doesn't return. They send a search uh, mission for him. Um, and they find him at death's door, horribly mutilated, mauled, bleeding from multiple you know, wounds. And uh, he's in a coma. Eventually, he emerges from the coma. The priest and the, rab uh, the, priest and the minister say, Rabbi, what happened to you? And, and in this weak voice, he says, you know, on second thought, maybe starting with circumcision wasn't the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, do you, have a, do you have a second thought? <laughs> Look, you know, um, before I got to the Times, this tells you something about modern media. I wrote uh, 550 columns for the journal, of which maybe five or six were devoted to uh, uh, climate change. And um, 
groups like Media Matters for America and other sort of left-wing advocacy groups decided to cherry pick quotes from that and other columns to paint a portrait of me as a uh, Muslim-hating bigot, uh, climate change denier, and other you know, bad words in their, in their lexicon. So it had already become this controversy before I even reached the, the proverbial uh, door. Well, did the person who hired you at the time say, you know, we really aren't sure whether we want you to get into the climate change? Nobody, look, I want to say something. The Times has been nothing but fantastic. No one has ever suggested, hinted, or, or in any way influenced what I have chosen to write. They no have, copy editor said that day, you sure, Mr. Stevens, you want to go with the climate change? No. Well, maybe they should have. But um, <laughs> uh, look, I don't regret it because at but least finish an, the an, story intelligent, about an intelligent reader of the column will come away saying that this is actually an argument not, against, not about climate change and not about what our policies right. ought to be. It's really not. Actually. It's an argument about s intellectual certitude and how that gets us into trouble when we advance an argument with so much confidence that we just know this is right. Hillary's going to win. 85% chance on election day for sure that she's, uh, she's going to win. Why is she going to win? Because the data tells us it's going to happen. And sometimes it doesn't happen. And if you have any sort of historical memory, you will remember that Paul Ehrlich in the 1960s was assuring us that we were going to be suffering incredible famines uh, around now because there was no way food production could meet uh, population growth. And just a few years ago, we were being told with absolute certainty that we had reached peak oil and we were going to be suffering from terrible economic crises because we hadn't prepared for a post-oil future. Now we're living in you know, an oil bonanza. Now, obviously, these are not the same things. And obviously, there's an important argument to be made that because the possibility that climate change can be so ruinous even if it's less than 100%, we need to have an insurance policy. And I think that's right. We should have an insurance policy because there is a, a large body of scientific evidence showing temperature increases from the late 19th century to the present. And if these continue unabated, they're going to have consequences. That's right. But all of you in this room have some form of insurance. And all of you have to ask, well, exactly how much am I willing to pay for that insurance? And that's where the interesting questions really lie. Do we want to get the most expensive form of climate insurance? Do we want to wait for technologies to mature, carbon sequestration, or um, any number of other things, and think at that point when, they, you know, when, when the price starts coming down in a significant way, that's when we, we make our move? Those are all completely valid differences and debates that honorable people can have. But what, worried, what, what distressed me was I write a column that really is about certitude. Some large number of readers failed to read the column for what it was or thought. And one of the most interesting criticisms of the column was Stevens is really insidious because he, he comes across, uh, across as a reasonable uh, climate denier. But what should I have done, come across as a crazy climate denier? Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm making an argument in, in good faith. And, and I think that's important to have. And, and it's when, when you predict, for instance, that the Himalayan glaciers are going to vanish in 30 years, which was a prediction that then had to be retracted from one of the uh, UN uh, reports, you end up looking foolish. You end up looking like the boy who cries wolf. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot more to be said for a much more judicious approach to the subject, and I think that will win over a great many people who are not deniers, who are honest people who want their children to live on a healthy planet, but who'll say, hang on, you kind of sound like the people who were selling me on population, you know, zero population growth a few years well, ago. Well, the point that you make in the, in the column, which is interesting, is you said when the polling is out there, two-thirds of America doesn't seem to care that much. Right? Well, Isn't that, what is it? What is it that you can read it one of two ways, which is, but basically, at least two thirds don't think it's the most pressing issue right. of, of the millennium. Right. So you're saying in some cases, you're really trying to convince that two thirds, right? You, Every side is actually. Look, when I write my column, I'm trying to write for the reasonable person on the other side. There are columnists who basically beat the drums for their own side. Every night, Sean Hannity goes on TV. And to many of us, it's 
it, it, it's like watching some very, like a person taking off his clothes on the subway or something horrible, <laughs> right? But to, to a certain <laughs> group of people, um, to a certain group of people, it's great. It's, it's what they're there for. And, and I don't believe that that's the role of a columnist right. or a commentator um, now, especially now, I would say. Mm. I am looking to, to the person who's just over uh, on the center left. And I don't want him or her to agree with me, but I want him to say, I can see that. Well, what about the people who are the 40,000 people who are not on the center left? Yeah who want to, wanted you fired. Yeah. We are living in a very strange time to be a columnist. We were talking about this backstage. Uh, the columnists of earlier eras, Walter Winchell, uh, Sidney Harris, uh, William Sapphire, you know, they would get some letters, would come into the mailroom of the newspaper. There would be a letter to the editor, editor who would edit some of them and put them out there. Today, anyone with a phone sitting with their, in their underwear eating donuts, has the power on their phone to comment. Thousands of people do this yeah. on the New York Times website. By the way, here's something that's very different. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had a paywall, yeah. right? So you just didn't have access to either read or to comment. The New York Times, anyone just shows up, reads your column, and all of a sudden they have a response. Well, half the time they don't read the column. Or they don't read the column, but they, <laughs> but they weigh in anyway. The internet trolls, social media people. Uh, I was reminded of, I just love this one, about a month or two ago he wrote a column, and you don't even write the headlines, right? No, I write the headlines. Oh, you write the headlines. So this one was, a modest immigration proposal, colon, ban Jews, right? Now if you know anything about him, he doesn't mean ban Jews. He's not saying we should be banning Jews, and if you read the article, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, the a column, we can talk about what, what, what the purpose was, but people attacked you now that you were an anti-Semite. Yes, I'm an anti-Semite. I'm and the most pro-Israel, anti Jewish anti-Semite ever. So are, are you, when you're writing your columns, are you thinking about these people who are gonna be commenting? Do you say to yourself, the hell with them. I write my columns for the people just over the center line, and I don't read, I mean, I, your, our mutual friend Barry Weiss, I just heard her the other day saying that she actually reads her Twitter feeds. Yes. She, and I'm thinking, I'd never occurred to because me. Because Jews are masochists, so. Um, I would think that you would just, you have better things to do. No, I read them too. Uh, it, it, it's like that famous joke, why don't Jews drink? Answer, it dulls the pain. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, look, I. I, um, you know, if you, if you are vaguely literate and you see the title that says a modest immigration proposal, your mind immediately goes to Jonathan Swift and you know that the title is inherently satirical. And then if you read the article itself, it's a thought exercise. A hundred, 110 years ago, what did people say about Jewish immigrants? Criminals. Uh, <laughs> they, the, the U U uh, New York police commissioner said that Jews committed crimes in disproportionate uh, numbers. Um, uh, 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 Henry Adams talked about uh, uh, filthy Isaac and Disease. Jacob yeah. speaking their weird Yiddish. Yeah. Um, they were Bolsheviks and revolutionaries. They were this, that, and the other. Student radicals, communists. And, well, that, that was true, actually. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> But the, all, all of these stereotypes, politically radical, yeah. unassimilable, dirty, um, they're talking about sort of Russian Jewry, not, not German Jewry. Um, uh, well, no, that, We're that, not referring to anyone in yeah. this room. No, but that, no, that, was, that, was the, that was the argument, that the Russian Jews from the, right. from the shtetl were, were, would never assimilate. And of course, within a generation, it was their children were Jonas Salk and Lionel Trilling and you know, go, down, uh, go down the list. So my point was the very same things that are now being said about Hondurans or Nigerians were being said about the most successful or the most no notably successful Im immigrant group to, to the United States. So I was trying to write for someone of, you know, at least room temperature IQ would, would like <laughs> get the point. But there are two aspects. First of all, you forget that half the country has below average IQ, 
by definitionally. And secondly, um, Twitter and other forms of social media are a forum in which the pleasures of hating are actualized through, through tweets. Because you have the distance and the anonymity to say about someone what you would never dream of saying in person. And I think that's, that's a phenomenon that is, is genuinely frightening. I, I mean, I, 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 can, I can barely see you, so I assume all of you are in your early 30s. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you're not a social media person, this whole world is, is unknown to you. It happens virtually. But if you are, you're, you're finding, you're discovering that we have entered into a digitalized version of mass, of the era of mass politics, reminiscent of the 1920s and 1930s. The ability of Twitter to convene a hate mob, uh, to, to throw digital sticks and stones on uh, a person of hate, uh, a, person of, uh, a person who's hated, is, is frightening and it's, it's phenomenal. And um, a I mean, I, in a sense, just went through this with my Woody Allen column. I was just um, going to mention that. You just had the exact same experience this past week. And now my, my, my skin is, is, is thick, but if your skin is not thick, it is a terrifying, it's a terrifying experience. And I really feel that, you know, we, we, we like to act, and this will be a segue to Woody Allen, but we, we pretend that certain kinds of political behavior is in the past. We pretend that totalitarianism is in our past. We're never, there, uh, Robert Kaplan, the author, made, made the point. He said, we, we think that these guys are like dinosaurs. They're, they belong to uh, a, a, a distant um, uh, geological uh, era. Um, but totalitarianism is really, and here I'm, I'm, I'm quoting him, it's really a function of loneliness. Why did totalitarianism succeed? Because the early, late 19th, early 20th century was the first period in history where loneliness became a social phenomenon. When you lived in a village and you had six children or whatever around you in the same room, loneliness wasn't a factor in life. But suddenly you have millions of people living in cities and discovering this concept of loneliness. And how does totalitarianism solve the problem of loneliness? It eradicates individuality. So you are pressed one to the other, and it's, it, it solves the problem of loneliness through brutality. Well, social media does something similar. There you are sitting by yourself eating your jelly donuts, but you're on social media, and you have your Facebook friends, and you're hating on Brett Stevens, who's the biggest tool ever, and how could the New York Times disgrace itself by hiring such a you know, racist bigot or whatever, and then you feel like a sense of community. Um, I would add that another, another phenomenon that we think we've put in the past is the idea that, that witch hunts, the Salem witch trials, are behind us. I don't think they're behind us at all. I think we're, just, we're going to experience them again and again in 20th and 21st century guises. Your defense of Woody Allen this past week well, is, this is my point. It's a nice segue. So you had another series of outrages yeah. from the social media connect. I sometimes write comms people like, but. Yeah. <laughs> And this one, you know, this one, I don't know if you would say it react, the reaction was even worse than the climate change, but there was even an article, there was a, someone wrote an attack in- Multiple. Uh, multiples. Slate wasn't the only one. Slate was, that one was yeah. awful and, and, and demonstrably wrong, factually wrong, by the way. Um, uh, essentially calling attention to the possibility that maybe we shouldn't rush to judgment too quickly on Woody Allen. And that in this era of the hashtag Me Too, uh, is now anti-feminist, refuses to acknowledge the suffering yeah. of individual victims, uh, and you were merely pointing out a number of things. And you know, remember, many of the actors that worked for Woody Allen have now denounced him. And I mean, I must say, I was very surprised by that. People whose career was made by him that said they now regret that they ever worked with him, and and you know, and. And yet you took this position to say, look, you know, maybe it's, it's too soon to rush to judgment, and yet you were yet attacked for that as well. Let me make uh, one small point and then, and then answer what you're saying. The small point is if anyone in the audience is here from Slate or some of these minor inconsequential publications, <laughs> um, at some point you recognize that these attacks are ultimately tributes to the power and influence of the New York Times. And so I just take it as a compliment. Um, I mean, Donald Trump's one insight is there's no such thing as bad publicity. But uh, 
Um, so long as I don't think the arguments land, land blows, I'm, I'm not bothered by them. I'm somewhat flattered. Uh, the second thing is, you know, again, with, with respect to Allen, the truth of what happened is unknowable, right? It is unknowable. Unless Allen confesses or Dylan Farrow recants, we will not know, okay? What we do know is that unlike, say, Harvey Weinstein or these other monsters, the f fact base, which has remained basically unchanged over the past 25 years, um, would not give any pr prosecutor serious grounds to say, I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this occurred. And in fact, there is considerable evidence that it did not occur, right? Now, this isn't to say that there isn't evidence on the other side. And it's not to say that, by the way, Woody Allen isn't in many respects a distasteful person. And the idea of having an affair with Sunni Previn, who was not his daughter, not his stepdaughter, it was Mia Farrow's adopted daughter with Andre Previn, but that's, that's a common misconception. But the point I was making is, A, if there are such significant doubts, should we, and especially should we journalists, be jumping to such um, damning conclusions? Because calling someone a child molester is a mark of Cain. It is, the, the mere accusation is, is a form of punishment that is, is a very serious one. So we should tread carefully, not least given how often senior journalists have uh, pointed fingers at people who were innocent. So that's, that's I think, one, uh, one point. The second point is, how is it that the Me Too movement, which is a liberal and progressive movement, and which, by the way, any normal person should support, right, and should endorse and embrace, but the Me Too movement only damages itself um, and will destroy itself if it adopts an attitude that all charges, all accusations are tantamount to fact, and anyone charged needs to be immediately defenestrated from their careers, they should be shunned, and so on. Because I don't think, any, I mean, who doesn't want to stop people like Weinstein or Lauer or Kevin Spacey? These are terrible people, and there's no, no one, on, no sane person on earth would deny what a serious problem routine sexual harassment is in, in, in workplaces and, and elsewhere. But why would any person who's associated with the movement want to taint it with a kind of um, uh, aggressive dismissal of issues of fairness, due process. I mean, you know, uh, my colleague Barry Weiss said this, I think, very eloquently the other day on, 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 on television. If you ask a liberal, what do you think about a zero tolerance policy towards drugs, right? They'd say, well, that's horrible. People deserve second chances. You know, you have to take a look at it. What about a zero attitude policy towards sexual harassment? Absolutely. <laughs> that's a bit of a double standard. I mean, either we're going to sort of try, uh, and, and we need to also weigh cases differently. There's a huge, I mean, Matt Damon said this, which is the most anodyne comment I can imagine, simply making the point, there is a very big difference between rape and sexual assault and, and sort of petty harassment. Not that petty harassment isn't bad and shouldn't be condemned and stopped, but, but the law exists to make distinctions between high crimes and misdemeanors, between felonies and, 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 and misdemeanors. And if you start eradicating that, if you try to morally flatten everything, at the end of the day, the reaction of men will be either dismissal or retreat. Whereas actually what the Me Too movement wants to do, I think, is enlist men into an absolutely righteous cause to end a certain form of behavior which is disgusting and abominable. I was reminded by what your column that you wrote for Thanksgiving, which was, was largely about your father. Uh, I, I knew your father. In fact, he came to a number of events. He's sitting in this stage when you and I have been up here. Uh, a very elegant, dignified man. And you were talking about this in the context of, of Harvey Weinstein and saying that, you know, a lesson that you learned from your father. And at some point, you, you gave this anecdote about what happened when you were seven years old. But the, the comment that I remembered in that column is where you said, in referring to the men that have committed these acts, you said, who raised these guys? Oh. Right. Well, my dad was a gentleman. Um, so the story is, when I was seven years old, I was in his office. And um, as these things happen, uh, 
I walked past a secretary and patted her behind. Um, and she, to her infinite credit, she was holding a, a stack of papers. She turned around, she slammed that stack of papers on my head. I must have been, you know, four feet, whatever. So being the indignant little brat that I was, I went to my dad and said, you know, the secretary just hit me. And he said, well, why did, why did she do that? And I kind of confessed, <laughs> confessed it. And he dragged me over to her desk and insisted that I apologize. And that's a lesson that boys need to learn at a very early age. Um, and it was, it, it, you know, it's one of these episodes that you, you remember and then you think, boy, what, what, a, what an impact that had on me that my father just believed that there was a code of conduct when it came to behaving as a man toward women. Um, and I think one of the things that has happened that, fr that, that worries me is, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, the concept of gentlemanliness is being devalued in the culture because it's seen as sort of suggesting patriarchal values or one thing or another. There are a variety of attacks on, on you know, if you ride the subway in New York, they're getting rid of the phrase ladies and gentlemen, you know, uh, the, when the announcer and they now say yeah. passengers or customers or whatever, whatever it is. But gentlemanliness really ought to matter. And I think when I think of so many of these cases, like who, who gave these guys the idea that you just open the bathrobe and, you know, saunter over. Uh, that's crazy, <laughs> you know? Who does that? But, and, and as you said, who raised these people? Well, so, you said it. Uh, yeah, well, I did yeah. say that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, on some level, I, let's talk a little about uh, Donald Trump, and I want to talk about Israel, and then we'll get some questions. Uh, I wonder whether the Donald Trump presidency in its first year, in many ways, forces you to be at war with yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a guy that almost everything he's done, to some degree, you probably agree with in terms of his policies. Uh, the economy, the stock market is roaring. Uh, well, you, was. Until it was. <laughs> you, uh, you, uh, there's, what is it, three and a half percent growth rate, economic growth rate since he took office. Uh, inflation is one percent or something. Mm -hmm. uh, unemployment is four percent. Uh, the, the, uh, he's added 800,000 jobs, uh, he's deregulated industries, he's increased military defense spending, he moved the embassy from Tel Aviv, or hasn't yet, but he's going to, in recognizing Jerusalem. He's decertifying the Iran deal. Uh, he's talking tough with North Korea. Yeah. Uh, even the tax uh, bill, the tax measure, uh, you know, just on Apple alone, $38 billion of taxes are going to be now paid by, by Apple. They're creating, what, 20,000 jobs. They're building a whole new campus. On some level, you must say to yourself, God, you know, he's doing things that I actually am happy with, but your column, actually, I think at one point you said, at one point, even with everything, you say, um, the uh, morally unfit for his office, and even with all of this, it, it, it's, I still, I wish that Hillary Clinton were president. Yeah. That, like, how, as how you, you said, my fans are on both sides yeah, here. Yeah, how uh, are, you must be at war with yourself. This no, presidency no, no, must I, be so offensive to you that a guy who, from your perspective, ideologically, is getting everything right, is still someone you despise. Look, first, let me make a couple points. I have... As a columnist, when Trump has done things I have agreed with, I have written in agreement. Uh, um, what bothers me is, you know, the, next to the never Trumpers, there are the always Trumpers who mm -hmm. seem to never find any fault with a guy, no matter what he does. Um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said something interesting about politics. He said the central truth of the central conservative truth is that. It is culture, not politics, that determines the success of a society. And then he went on to add the central liberal truth is that politics can overcome culture to shape society for, uh, for the better. I subscribe to Moynihan's insight on the importance of culture. There are a lot of policies that I like, and we'll see how they, they, they work out. But eventually, those policies are going to go away. 
eventually a Democrat will be elected into office and whatever has happened in terms of deregulation or Supreme Court justices, all that will, will, will wash away. What won't wash away is the culture of governance which Trump has brought with him to the White House and uh, the, the precedent that he has set in terms of how, um, how the chief executive can behave towards his own agencies of government. I mean, just, just to give you an example, uh, we have a president who is launching an unprecedented attack on his own FBI and both the director as well as the uh, attorney general and deputy attorney general, all of whom he, he appointed. Now, I think that that is corrosive because the, what makes America great are our institutions. And our institutions depend on trust. And the President of the United States is actively and aggressively applying a corrosive agent to that sense of trust. And it's that method that leads, from, leads us from small r republicanism to populism to autocracy. Hmm. And that's what, I, that's what I worry about. I think people have to think beyond policy over the next three or uh, my guess is eight years um, and, and think of the institutional damage. And that ought to matter, by the way, that really ought to matter to conservatives because we're supposed to be the institution right. guys. One sentence on this and we'll move on to something else. Brett Stevens wrote, every vote cast for Donald Trump was a vote for, vo was a vote for vulgarity. His supporters got exactly what they paid for. Well, yes, I mean. We don't know, even, I think you can leave it at that. Well, but <laughs> I don't think you have to add anything. I'll add, I'll add this. Uh, you know, being who I am, I love the movie Gladiator. Uh, and there's that wonderful scene where Maximus, you know, Russell Crowe. You've is, seen this, right? Has just yeah, okay. demolished all of his op opponents in the arena, and he starts screaming, Are you not entertained? Right. And there's a quality, <laughs> a, an addictive quality to our politics, which has become more a matter of. Of, of sheer entertainment. Bread and circuses. Then, well. In fact, perhaps a military parade is an excellent example of that. Yes. Uh, Israel and the New York Times. I, I cannot tell you how many people wrote me emails or on my Facebook page saying, we have to talk to Brett about New York Times and its coverage of Israel or the biased perceived coverage of Israel. It does seem, and you're, you're not here to defend your paper, but I'm just curious how you respond to this because you, for most of your career, you were somewhere else and you might have noted biases. But there are people who think, and by the way, if you're on a university campus, <laughs> it's worse, but there are people who would say, you know, the New York Times is interested in Israel's imperfections. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interested in when there are disproportionate Palestinian f fatalities. It's not so interested in Palestinian violence, terrorism, and incitement. Um, it's interested in settlement building. It's not really so interested in school books that call Jews Israelis pigs and monkeys or in chanting songs from the river to the sea, right? You get the idea. That it's just interested in one part of this story. Do you actually agree to some degree that, uh, that the Times coverage of Israel is somewhat skewed, skewed in a way that I would say is very familiar on a university campus or on most intellectual magazines that are published in this country in, or in England? Well, what I agree is that um, the quality of the paper um, is undoubtedly improved by having uh, such a prominent pro-Israel voice as mine on the opinion pages. Well, let me ask you this. <laughs> now that you open that window, I wonder whether that was communicated to you at some point. You know, we need you. You grant us a kind of legitimacy that we really don't have. If we hire you, I, I, we I, can't be anti-Israel. I think when I was hired, the management of the Times took very intelligent stock of the fact that the country was in a different place and that the paper would be improved. I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully. Mm -hmm. um, that the paper would be, I'm not choosing my words carefully because 
for, for just sheer professional comedy reasons. I'm, I'm not worried about Big Brother listening to me. Um, this is live streamed. The Times is watching. I, I, I mean this. I mean, I mean this in all uh, in all sincerity. I think they understood that the paper needed to play to a larger audience than the proverbial Upper West Side. That it is a national. It is the national paper, and they have to broaden the range of voices, uh, and 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 that the paper would be improved with more disharmony. Uh, on, uh, on at least certainly on on the editorial pages, um, and by the way, you know, in, in our friend Barry's hiring, they also got a you know powerfully uh, a powerfully pro-Israel. Uh, voice. And by the way, many people like myself, we were surprised. We thought that there was a, a statement was being made that you and Barry Weiss had moved over to the New York Times. And you will see op-eds by people like Yossi Klein Halevi and Michael Oren, in addition to to mine, uh, appearing on on the opinion pages. And I think that's, that's very, very important that um, the paper understood in the wake of the election that they needed to broaden their horizons and they moved swiftly and aggressively to do so with the people they believed were the very best in the business. Um, this new view that you have, a window from the New York Times, does it change your thinking about any of the subjects that you wrote about so widely. Have you seen things that you've been writing about differently through a different lens, either by riding an elevator with somebody or having lunch with somebody? Has it changed your experience in how you view the world? Well, I've dis discovered that socialism is a very, very wise approach to economic management. and. Uh, <laughs> I'm planning on so writing a, no a, a pro Nicolas Maduro <laughs> column for tomorrow. Um, no, look, uh, uh, there were subjects that I never really had an opportunity or an inclination to write about at the journal that now are open to me. I mean, for one thing, I was the foreign affairs columnist at the journal. It was just that during the Trump period, I just went berserk, and all I did was write about Trump because I thought he was such a terrible uh, uh, terrible road to go down. Um, but uh, let's take gun control, for example. I, I hadn't really thought about gun control, and I sort of had osmotically accepted the view that the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, and we live in this world that is awash in guns, and most gun control schemes don't work because uh, you're simply taking guns away from the hands of responsible owners while doing nothing to get them out of the hands of, of, of bad ones. Um, I find that argument very hard to sustain when I think about it after the massacre in Las Vegas. Um, and the argument on the right is, uh, well, um, things like those massacres are just the price we pay for living in a free society. In that case, Shouldn't we make a strong argument for the civil rights of, li of, of, of possible terrorists? Because isn't terrorism also the price we pay for living in a, in a free society? So if you're going to make the argument as a conservative, you know, we have to take stringent measures to prevent terrorists from acting through surveillance and other methods, which I accept, by the way, then that same argument ought to apply to the ubiquity of, of guns. I mean, how is it possible that a man like, uh, what was his name, Paddock in, mm -hmm. in uh, and it tells you something that I, I can't remember his name, um, in, in, in Las Vegas could buy how many uh, semi quasi-automatic weapons because it's unlimited. I can understand that you need a shotgun because you live in the, out in the country or you need a revolver because you live in a bad part of town. But why do you need 20 shotguns or, or 15 revolvers or, or whatever? So, th so going to the Times felt like, at least on some subjects, like a permission to say, you know, since I can write about anything, there are some issues that I need to think through again. And by the way, that's true of many things. I think that a columnist, I I'm not coming to the Times to be an ideologue. Hmm. I'm hopefully coming to the Times to be a pretty smart guy who can write fairly well 
and is prepared from time to time to change his mind. And I think, you know, Judge Learned Hand uh, said something in 1944. He said, uh, and I'm, I'm misquoting here, there's a lawyer in the audience who will correct me, but you know, he said, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not, that is not too sure it is right. And it's a, it's a beautiful, redolent phrase. It's and like your climate change call. Well, I want to be not too, I, I don't want to be so sure I'm right that I'm, I'm simply, I turn, close my heart to the possibility of being persuaded. If I'm trying to persuade you of something, you ought to have the possibility of persuading me because I haven't just shut down my brain to what you might have to say. Um. I'm going to ask a tough question. You opened, you mentioned terrorism, so let's, let's talk about that for a moment. I wonder whether, here's another area that you're in tension with yourself. Um, you write so eloquently, and especially you've given this opportunity, not just because you're at the Times, because of President Trump's attitudes. Build a wall, ban all Muslims. Your experience is having, I think Tom mentioned, you grew up in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to, to build a wall on Mexico, th these are your kin. You know, this is personal to you. Um, and so you've taken a very strong pro-immigration and your, your statistics are very compelling. I, I don't, we, you probably remember some of the ones that you've pointed out that, what is it, the percentage of companies that are started, yeah. Fortune 500 companies started. 40% of Fortune 500 companies amounting to $4.8 trillion of revenue started were by, started by immigrants or the founders of immigrants. 35% of all Nobel Prize winners. Are foreign born. Right, 85% of all uh, Intel winners, foreign born. Children of immigrants. Although 82% of the 86 went to Stuyvesant High School. <laughs> Where his daughter was. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying. She was a semi-finalist, actually. Um, <laughs> that's such a New York City joke. The people watching from any other park, we couldn't possibly get that joke. Um, I ask this because you're, you come from the Wall Street Journal. You've written about terrorism. I don't know. I can't remember whether you think that you're in favor of the Patriot Act whether you think Guantanamo Bay should remain open, yeah. whether civilian trials are not what we should be pursuing, but instead military tribunals. Um, you just raised this point with terrorism. Donald Trump is inelegant in everything he says, but what if he were here and he said, look, you know, I say things, but what I'm really talking about is, I don't want the Tsarnaev brothers here. Yeah. I don't want, you know, you and I will, will say, we were on stage at the 92nd Street Y a number of years ago. We still probably think it's the best experience we had on this stage. We were here with Ayan Hirsi Ali. Yeah. Some of you may have been here. And she said, she said, look, you know, I just think it's important to remember that people who come from Muslim countries that believe in a strict adherence to Sharia law opens up the same kind of problems that you have in France and Sweden and in, you know, we've seen this in Germany. So. You haven't written about this, but this is a question. If, you're, if you deliver this only in terms of banning all Muslims or building walls, it sounds, you know, anti-American, illiberal, anti-pluralistic. But how does one balance this other concern? Because European countries are experiencing that problem yeah. with there, immigration. There has been one case that we know of in which a terrorist has crossed, has entered the United States by crossing a land border. He came from Canada. So absolutely, we need to build a wall with Canada. Uh, I mean, if, that's, if, if, if you want an evidence-based you know, approach, that would be you know, built along the 49th parallel. Um, look, you cannot confuse immigration policy with counterterrorism policy. And uh, they shouldn't be. Uh, they, 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 they shouldn't be confused. You're not, it, 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 it's not going to work. Um, a counterterrorism policy has to be focused on, you know, finding bad guys. Uh, I do believe in certain kinds of uh, common sense uh, surveillance. I do think that certain strains of Salafist Islam have uh, a well-known history of breeding uh, Islamist uh, terrorist extremism and so on. And you need to, to approach that that way. But let me ask you something. What was the worst espionage in American history? Um, we're not, you're gonna, 
we're, we're not talking about the Rosenbergs, are we? Yeah, well, uh, unquestionably. I knew, I knew this is where he was going, right? America's most important military secret of the Cold War was betrayed by the Rosenbergs, or Mort Sobel, right. or any uh, David Greenglass. Uh, they were all Jews. So if I were it just to wasn't it wasn't Ethel. We'll just let you just say it was it, uh, whatever. Um, just, just leave Ethel out, all okay. right? Um, all that's all I ask. My fantasy, by the way, is making an HBO series about the Rosenbergs. Um, uh, the um, if you if you were to say you're going to let in these Jews, and they are going to betray the biggest secret that is going to then create an era of nuclear terror for generations, you might say, God, you know, how, why should we let in these Bolsheviks, you know, from wherever, uh, um, Belarus? But you'd then have to say, but you're not going to get Lionel, you're not going to get Jonas Salk. Right. You're not going to get Lionel Trilling. And then the counter argument is, well, there are Jews, you know, Salk and Trilling and so on. I'm sorry, you, you look at immigrants from across the immigration spectrum, Africans, Latin Americans, and so on, and what you find are extraordinarily hardworking people who have self-selected to get themselves out of their country and made an extraordinary effort to get to the United States, not for welfare, not so that they can live squalid lives here, but so that they can rise. You know, my great-grandfather came from Kishnev to uh, lower Manhattan and worked as a carpenter uh, for, for, for his life in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Right? So the, what's extraordinary about the United States and what I think makes America the greatest country by far on earth is this astounding faith we have that if you take someone like my great-grandfather or if you take some, some guy from Nigeria who you know, wants to come to this country, that, that what's, what seems to be that poor human material, no Norwegian blood whatsoever, <laughs> right? No kind of... Scandinavian godliness, uh, uh, and so on, that that Schmendrick from Bessarabia, right, and that character from Honduras or Haiti, that maybe not them, but their kids are going to end up at Stuyvesant. And I know it because I live next to Stuyvesant. Fifty years ago, all the kids at Stuyvesant would have been Jews. Not all, but lots of the kids at Stuyvesant would have been Jews. I walk out of my building, and the kids are coming out, and they're all... Indians are East Asians, and then your daughter, right? <laughs> the last Jewish girl at Stuyvesant, right? And who are these kids? They're going to be your doctor, your lawyer, uh, and, and hopefully one day your president, right? And so this, this belief in immigration, this belief that people like my great-grandfather or my mother could come here with so little, and within the space of even just one generation have a son who would pontificate from the stage of the 92nd Street Y, is what makes America great. I have two, <laughs> I have uh, two comments about that. First of all, I have twins, so there were two of them okay. at the same time. Uh, the second thing is I have the best answer to Donald Trump on this. And you know what it is? Apple. Uh, Steve Jobs' uh, father was Syrian. We never really think of it that way. He would say, I want the Norwegians, I just don't want the Syrians. Well, you wouldn't have had Apple. All right. Um, Let's take some questions from our audience. Uh, let's start with this one. Which newsroom, uh, forward slash editorial board, and you would know this because you served on the editorial board at the Wall Street Journal, is more tolerant of diverse opinions, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal? I think that, I think that the Times in the last nine months has made such extraordinary strides <laughs> that, uh, um, I'm going to leave it at that. Go All ahead. right. Do you think Trump is a direct response uh, or I think it's or even a correction to an overly PC Obama? Yes, absolutely. Now, I want to I want you to talk a little about in answering this question, because you when you were on the Bill Maher show, uh, I, well, I found what you said very compelling. You were talking about a kind of and you've written about this in your columns, a kind of liberal democratic smugness, elitism, yeah. uh, a contempt for the deplorables that, that ended up to some degree uh, galvanizing a lot of votes for Donald yeah. Trump. I, I, look, uh, this is a column I've got to write. 
uh, I've got to write a, uh, imagine a good Donald Trump. The problem with Donald Trump is that there is a great difference between the health and intellectual uh, iconoclasm of being politically incorrect versus just being a jerk, <laughs> right? Uh, so, I mean, he could have delivered this message differently. Well, there's a lot about political correctness which is suffocating and, and sometimes kind of fascistic. You can't say that. I mean, people criticize my comms. Fine, criticize away. But when the answer is, Stevens must be fired, you know, that's, that's taking it a step further. I mean, not, not, you know, why can't you just say, Stevens got it wrong this time? Totally disagree. Liked his other column. Well, or, or the, what the Woody Allen, the, uh, the talk now is he may not direct another film. Well, I, I would be surprised if he d does. So there is an aspect if, if you have, and by the way, don't take it from me. Take it from liberals. Take it from Andrew Sullivan. Take it from Jonathan Haidt. Take it from anyone who, who has experienced the sort of suffocating orthodoxies of, of college campuses and uh, university faculty. Take it from someone like Brett Weinstein, a, a, a liberal left-wing biology teacher uh, out in the West Coast, who simply objected to the idea this that- This is evergreen college. Yeah, th that all white people should leave campus uh, on, on, a, on a given day, just as a, just as a, uh, as a matter of principle. Uh, take it from anyone, any, anyone who's tried to speak on campuses and either been physically assaulted or ban barred from, from uh, 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 speaking, there's a problem out there. Liberals are supposed to be liberal. Liberalism begins with tolerance. It begins with a commitment to free speech and a diversity of ideas and an ability to entertain in a civilized way opinions with which we might disagree, right? That is a great liberalism. <laughs> but what we have is a kind of uh, uh, a, 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 a fascism of of 21st century virtues. And that's, it would be wonderful to have a smart Trump who could have said, this is nonsense and that's ridiculous and this is a free country and Americans are not deplorable, right? And since when did the Democratic Party representing presumably the working class decide that half the country uh, was too smelly for them or liked their guns too much or drank the wrong beer or you know whatever? Uh, you know, the country is not Martha's Vineyard. Um, and uh, uh, so that would have been an amazing thing for him to do. But when you are a bigot, when you say horrible things about women, uh, when you set the tone that he has, he has eviscerated his own moral authority. The other day he sent out a tweet saying, since when did we lose sight of, you know, due process and all the rest of it? It was a fine tweet except coming from the guy who called for the Central Park Five to be executed, there was a kind of a credibility gap. Uh, surely there was one question I wanted to talk about Israel, so someone wanted you to comment on the news about Bibi. Yeah. Are you ready to talk about that? Are you thinking of writing about the news? No, of course I'm ready to talk about it. Look, it's wonderful. Um, there is one country in the Middle East where if a prime minister or president uh, commits crimes, uh, they're accountable for it. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Does and happen to Israel a lot. Well, th that says something, that's a great testament to a country that um, has subjected its political leadership to scrutiny and to a demand to live up to ethical standards that you would be um, hard pressed to find, never mind in the Arab world, in other democracies. Yeah, I mean, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is it's not the first time Israel holds its leaders accountable. You know, uh, Andre Asaman just wrote his second of the mm. third series of books on the story of history of Jews, and I just reviewed it recently for the Washington Post. And he actually points out that this is a long thing with a long time problem with Jews. You know, uh, David was flawed. You know, all Moses, all of our leaders have been flawed, and so that of course our prime ministers and presidents are also flawed. Um, uh, look, I mean, this is again, uh, you know, all the left-wing, hyper-progressive criticism of Israel somehow misses the fact that if you care about the rule of law, if you care about justice, if you care about civil liberties and human rights, if you believe 
in the dignity of being gay or woman, whatever, the only country you want to live in in the Middle East is Israel. And yet that's the only country <laughs> that its very legitimacy is constantly being questioned. Well, and beyond that, it's the only country where if Israel, um, you know, if an Israeli shell goes 10 meters astray, it's a war crime that is investigated by the United Nations. Meanwhile, war crimes of that sort are being perpetrated almost by the minute in, in Syria. And I wonder, where are the campus protests? I'd love to see those idealistic students standing up against the tyranny of Bashar Assad and the aid that he gets from Vladimir Putin and the Ayatollah Khamenei. It would be great to have some honesty from, 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 from social justice warriors and a sense of proportion when it comes to addressing crimes around the world. Maybe this is a time as the, the, your, your final send off to tell the story that I know you've told before about when you were in Jerusalem as uh, working for the Jerusalem Post and you met with the Belgian ambassador because that's the answer that you get. I don't know if you remember that story, that anecdote. It was the European ambassador. European yeah. ambassador. This is the answer. He asks a very good question to all of us. Why is it that, you know, why is it that on campuses you don't see any outrage about six million Congolese? When it comes to occupations, no one talks about the Kurds. The poor Kurds, my God. The Kurds, the Kashmiri, the, the Northern Cypriots, uh, the Tibetans. No one ever wants to talk about that, quote, occupation. Well, it, 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 and it's so, reminiscent of that wonderful line from Eric Hoffer when he said that Israel is the only country in the world expected to behave like a Christian nation. Um, uh, and, and this is, you know, this is, a serious, this is a serious point. So when you ask this Belgian, this European ambassador. He said, I will never forget it. He you, said, you asked them this question. I said, well, at the time it was 2002. It was before Syria's, Syrian forces had left Lebanon. And I said, Syria's been occupying Lebanon for, I guess, 26 years at the time. You, you guys, you Europeans, never say anything about that. But you, every day, it's another demarche about, uh, about Israel. And he said, ah, but you see, it's different. We regard the Arabs like, I don't know, Cambodians, or, you know, or those people. You, you Israelis, you're one of us. So we have different standards for you. And I thought, well, that's funny because when my mother was a child, we were most definitely not one of you. Um, <laughs> uh, you were hunting us down. And now, so you were persecuting us then because we didn't belong, and you're uh, prosecuting us now because ostensibly we, we do belong. And that's, that's a real problem. Look, Israel should not be treated, is, Israel is a country of human beings, and human beings do all sort, commit all kinds of folly and all kinds of crime. And there are all kinds of legitimate reasons why sensible and decent people can take issue with this or that uh, Israeli policy. But where I do violently object, well, vehemently object, is when Israel is uh, demonized, when Israel is treated to a standard or held to standards which are never enforced, never mind when it comes to the Russians or the Chinese, but when it comes to Americans. I mean, the United States bombs a hospital in Afghanistan, it's regrettable. Clearly, it's an error. Had Israel done that? Forget it. And, and this, is, this is important, and this is also important, I think, if we're going to have a morally centered West. I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, this is probably taking the argument a step too far, but the, the health of countries historically has, in part, I don't want to say depended, but been reflected by their attitude towards Jews. F not least because Jews are, in a sense, the minority par excellence. And, um, and they're the stranger. And if you ask yourself, why has America thrived uh, in, in our time? Because we have been a country that has opened its arms to talented strangers who, while maintaining a sense of identity, did nothing but contribute to making this country the phenomenon that it is. 
And you will find that when countries expel their Jews, whether it was Spain after the Reconquista or Germany in the 1930s, they decline. And it might not be reflective of the Jews. It might be simply reflective of how you view, uh, this is a kind of hoity-toity term, but the other. How do you view the stranger uh, uh, among you? The Arab world destroyed itself when it got rid of its Jews, and then it got rid of its Christians, and then it got rid of its Druze. And, and people so forget it's, what, it's around 900,000 Jews. Right. I mean, that's a huge number of Jews all throughout these Arab countries. But it's all the more reason why I think today it's so important to remind ourselves of how America isn't just incidentally a country of immigrants. It's centrally uh, a country of immigrants. A hundred years from now, when we reflect back on whether the 21st century was a success for the United States or not, well, we won't be asking ourselves whether we got lucky in this or that. I think we'll be asking ourselves whether we answered a few fundamental questions correctly. Were we a country that tolerated dissent and embraced its gadflies, or did we try to squash it and them? We're going to ask ourselves, are we a country that embraced innovation and radical disruption, or did we try to preserve ancient monopolies and ways of, of, of acting? But the most important question I think we're going to be asking is, were we a country that understood that foreigners were our most vital source of human capital and moral and spiritual renewal, or did we build walls and uh, create moats and fear the rest of the world rather than embrace it? And I think if we answer those questions in the right way, we're going to still be the same power that, that we are today. We are going to be the great last best hope of Earth. But return to a policy of isolation, of immigration uh, restriction, of fear of the rest of the world, and we're going to enter the same dark age we went into in the 1920s and 30s. You know, I think of T.S. Eliot's line, um, you know, oh, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Um, let's not go back to that, to that period. Brett, the New York Times is a much better <laughs> newspaper with you. And we're better off to read you. Thank you. Brett Stevens. Thank you very much.